It is good to be back at Harrison Street Baptist Church. It's been a few years, but I remember the very first time I came to this church. It was, I believe, in 1982. I had moved to Lincoln and was on staff at Southview Baptist Church, and they had a fellowship for church staff, the Eastern Nebraska Baptist Association. It was here at this church, and Jimmy Furr was the pastor way back then. And there was snow in the forecast, and I had two young children. We drove from Lincoln, and for once they got the forecast right. And it started snowing when we got here, and it kept snowing. And I don't know, three hours later, there was probably five or six inches of snow on the ground. And Jimmy, I did not even know Jimmy. I had just met him. He said, you and your wife and kids, you're going to drive back to Lincoln tonight, aren't you? I said, well, that's the plan. He said, come and stay with us tonight. You don't need to drive back in that snow. And it was still snowing pretty hard. So that was my first introduction to this church years ago. And I, I, I'm so thankful for the hospitality of the pastor you had. And, and Roger mentioned, we, we go back a ways. And your pastor called me, no, oh, probably five weeks ago and said, are you available to preach? I said, sure, have invitation, will come. So here I am. I noticed in the bulletin, you have a page to take notes. So let me tell you the title of the message this morning is how to overcome worry. So if you want to take notes, you can write that down, how to overcome worry. That is the title of the sermon this morning. And the key text is Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, and verses 6 and 7 are the key text this morning. Let me ask you, is there anyone here that during the past week has not worried about something? I don't, raise your hand if you, you know, I can't raise my hand. We have all worried about something this past week. We have all probably been anxious about something this past week. And we have all probably been fearful about something this past week. Well, this morning, I want us to look into God's Word and see what God says about anxiety. And anxiety and worry and fear, they're all kind of interconnected. They are human emotions that God has given us. But Many times, I don't know what to do with fear or worry or anxiety. And that's what I want us to look at today. What does God say about worry? And what are his instructions to us? What should we do when we find ourselves worried about something? Let me say this. There is no such thing as a born worrier. It is a lesson that we have learned in life, it's a response to life that we have learned. I heard the story of two businessmen, and boy, this is applicable to today. They were talking about the current economic recession. And Jack said, I'm about to lose my job and my house is in foreclosure, but I don't worry about it. Bob, his friend asked, well, how in the world can you not be worried? And Jack answered, I hired a professional worrier. He does all my worrying for me. That way, I don't even have to think about it. Bob replied, boy, that's a fantastic idea. How much does it cost to hire a professional worrier? Well, his friend said, $50,000 a year. And he said, where are you going to get that kind of money? Jack said, I don't know, that's his worry, not mine. <laughs> well, I don't know, that, that's not the right way to deal with worry. But in the world today, the last few years with COVID, in the hospital, I have visited with people that lived in almost a constant state of fear and worry and panic about COVID. And all of us, I'm sure, have been affected in one way or another, and many of us have lost a loved one. 
to COVID. The world we live in today is full of fear and anxiety and worry. This morning, I just want to have a brief prayer and ask God to take His Word through His Holy Spirit and show us how each one of us can apply it. So let's pray. Lord, we thank You that You've given us Your Word. You've given us Your Holy Spirit. And I pray that this morning in each of us, You will take Your Word and Your Holy Spirit and in each of our lives, we are all, we face different circumstances, different anxieties, different worries, different concerns, different fears. But Lord, I pray that the truths in your word today, you will take those and then we will apply them to our life as you lead us. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 4. And some preachers, they say, well, if you have an electronic version, turn that on as well. But in Philippians chapter 4, this was written by the Apostle Paul. And as far as we know, when the Spirit of God inspired him to write this, he was in jail. He, was, he proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It got the Jewish religious leaders upset. It got the Roman authorities upset. So here he is, as far as we know, writing this from prison. And one of the themes of the book of Philippians is rejoice. And here we see the Apostle Paul rejoicing in the midst of a difficult season of his life. So let's start with verse 1 of Philippians chapter 4. Therefore, my brothers... You whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord. So Paul is encouraging them, he's exhorting them, he called them his brothers, his joy and his crown. And he says, stand firm in the Lord. God wants us to stand firm in the Lord. Boy, the world's foundation today is not very firm or very steady. The economy, politically, the war in Ukraine, a lot of things are in turmoil. But Paul is telling them, stand firm in the Lord. And as a believer in Jesus Christ, we can stand firm in the Lord. Then verse 2, he deals with uh, a problem in the church in Philippi. I have been a pastor, and no church is perfect. Every church has struggles and problems, and it was the same in the first century. And in the church in Philippi, there were a couple of women that didn't get along. Verse 2, he says, I plead with Yodi and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. So he's saying, they're, they're, they're us, but help them to get along. And I think that's a word today. I've pastored churches where people haven't gotten along. It's nothing new, but he's encouraging them, you know, help these women, they're, they're dear sisters in the Lord, help them work this through so they can get along. Then he goes on and says, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So he commends them again. Your names are in the book of life. You're believers. Stand firm in the Lord. Then verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Once again, the book of joy. He's saying rejoice in the Lord. And then he exhorts them again. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. That's one of the fruit of the Spirit, gentleness. The Lord is near. And then verse 6 and 7 are key verses. Do not be anxious about anything. That's a command. Do you think God would give us a command that we couldn't keep? That's something to think about and pontificate on. But it's an imperative, a command. 
Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. And here's what God says to do when you're anxious by prayer. My paraphrase is talk to God about it. And petition, bring those requests before God. God, man, this is going on in my life. You know about it, but it, it's got me worried. It's got me concerned. It's got me upset. By prayer and petition with thanksgiving. And as you pray, God, I know you have the answer, and I'm going to thank you for giving me the answer to this, for answering my prayer. Present your request to God. And then God says in verse 7, when we do that, here's what will happen. And the peace of God, which transcends or passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That sounds like somebody that's standing firm in the Lord. So here we see God's answer to worry. First thing I want to say is we learn to worry from the experiences of life. We all have experiences that cause us concern, that cause us worry, that cause us anxiety or make us fearful. After years of uh, sometimes we make mistakes, sometimes we fail. We have unfulfilled expectations. And we discover that sometimes life just doesn't go the way we hoped it would go. But yet as believers, we know God is sovereign and God is in control. Out of the experiences of life, many times we develop the habit of worrying. A few years back, I had a neighbor who was a teacher in an elementary school. And I was taking out my trash one morning and she was taking hers out and I said, hi. And she said, I learned something yesterday. I had an interesting experience. I said, oh, tell me about it. And she said that her class was taking, I think it's called the IBT test. It's a test in elementary school that determines if the kids in that grade have learned what they need to learn at that grade level. That was my understanding of it. And she said, I had a boy that said, teacher, teacher, I'm sick. I need to go to the bathroom. He said, you know, just calm down. Everything will be okay. But he kept saying, teacher, I'm sick. I'm going to throw up. She said, she said, finally, I said, okay, go to the bathroom. So he was gone a while, and then he came back, and he was more calm. And he was able to take the test the rest of the day. And she said, at the end of the day, I went up and I asked him, you know, what, what, what was going on? And the little boy said, I learned this morning that my parents are going to get a divorce. And it made me so sick, I, I couldn't even take the test. She said, boy, I learned something from that, that, you know, that child was dealing with something that af affects his life, his world, that probably is going to cause him a lot of anxiety and a lot of worry as his future unfolds. So we, we can learn to worry from the experiences of life. And then secondly, we learn to worry from the examples around us. We all grew up in different families, different homes, different environments. But there have been some studies done that show that parents who are anxious, there's a tendency that the children they raise are also going to be anxious. And if you grew up in a home that was reasonably calm and stable, that you will probably have a better chance of growing up and having a home that is reasonably calm and stable and not an anxious environment. Anxious parents have a tendency many times, their kids come out anxious. And then thirdly, since worry is a learned behavior, as a response to life, it can be unlearned with God's help. Think about that. 
Dr. Daniel Amen, who is a Christian psychiatrist. I mean, he is a very strong believer. And he's a double board certified psychiatrist. And he has clinics, many of them across the United States. And he uses a special brain scan. It's not a CAT scan or an MRI. It's something different just for the brain. And the National Football League a few years back, commissioned him to do a study on NFL athletes, current ones and former ones, and just to see if they suffered head trauma from playing football. And it was fascinating. I saw the images on a webinar. He said, this is what a healthy brain looks like. And you could see all kinds of colors in that brain, and it was moving and functioning, and you could actually see the brain working while that scan was, uh, you know, the images were being taken. And then right next to it, he said, this is what an unhealthy brain looks like. And there were actually holes in the brain, pockets where there was nothing going on. And he said, this is an unhealthy brain. This is what a brain looks like where a person has suffered head trauma or been traumatized. And now modern medical science has a better understanding of PTSD, people who have had a very traumatic experience and how that can affect them. And now the new, newer thing is called moral injury. When you have a set of values and something happens where you have to violate those values that you hold dear. Uh, an example might be a military sniper. And, you know, he's got his sights and he's got them set on the bad guy, you know, a half mile away or whatever, ready to kill him. And he pulls the trigger and all of a sudden a little child comes running out in front and that child is killed instead of the bad guy. That's an example of moral injury. How do you live with that? You're doing what you're trained to do, but something goes wrong. And, you know, man, I never intended to kill that child. And today, you know, with the modern sciences and things, they can actually see how that affects the brain chemically. So it's amazing. But Daniel Amen. He said, when I watched this video, he had a can, just a regular spray can, and he made a new label for it, and he called it Ant Spray, and he abbreviated A-N-T. And what that stands for is automatic negative thoughts. All of us have learned to develop automatic negative thoughts. We have a random thought, and it it's probably something that isn't going to happen. But then we keep thinking about it, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and worse and worse and worse. And that automatic negative thought cycle can have an effect on our emotions. And so he, he had this can of ant spray, and he just went, Psh! and he said, you can learn with God's help those automatic negative thoughts, be aware of what's going on when you're getting into that cycle of automatic negative thoughts. And he said, ask yourself, is that thought true? Yes or no, and many times it's not true. It's just a thought you had. And ask yourself, is that likely to happen? Yes or no? And then he said, well, if it does happen, what's the worst thing that could happen to you? And the example he gave was uh, a patient finds out that they have stage four cancer. That is not a good diagnosis. But he said, if they are a believer, they'll just get to go and be with Jesus quicker than they would if they wouldn't have had cancer. So even if the outcome is not good or what we had hoped for, we can still experience God's peace and not be caught up in, you know, that automatic negative thought cycle. And I think we've all been there. And I know um, 
that, boy, when we're caught in the middle of that, I, one person called it a vortex of doom. You know, it just keeps spiraling and spiraling in our mind. So we have to be aware of what's going on. Take a step back and God, you know, help with this. You said that I can experience your peace. You said that I, I don't need to worry. Pray about it. Talk to God about it. And then experience God's peace. A starting point for overcoming worry is to realize it's useless. <laughs> worry doesn't do any good. Worry, one person said worry is stewing without doing. I like that. Worry is stewing without doing. Worry has never changed anything. It cannot change the past. It can't control the future. Worry only makes us miserable today. Worry never solved a problem. Worry never paid a bill. Worry never cured an illness. Many times worry can paralyze us so that we can't even work on a solution. I can think back of a couple of times when you know, I was responsible in management for this, that, or the other, and things weren't going the way I thought. And it's like, I, I was so upset and worried and concerned about it, I couldn't even come up with a solution or an answer. And worry can keep us from coming up with a solution or an answer or thinking straight. Someone else said, worry is like racing your car engine in neutral. It doesn't get you anywhere. It just uses up gas. I like that. We only have so much emotional energy. And when we worry and worry and worry, we're draining ourselves emotionally. And physically, we can get tired and we can get drained. I, in high school, I enjoyed cross country and track. I never won any medals or anything, but I enjoyed being on the team and I got my junior varsity letter. That was all I wanted and I got it. But now I try to stay healthy and in good shape. But if I tried to go and run 10 miles like I used to, I would not make it. I would be physically exhausted. It's the same way emotionally. We can drain ourselves emotionally by worry, and we need to be aware of that. Have you ever noticed that when you worry about a problem, it just gets bigger and bigger? That's what happens when we worry. I want to read Philippians 4, 6, and 7 out of the living paraphrase. It simply says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God your needs and don't forget to thank him for his answers. If you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will keep your thoughts and your hearts quiet and at rest as you trust in Christ Jesus. Isn't this what we all want? Peace and rest deep down in our hearts. That is how God says we can achieve his peace, that peace that passes all understanding. So God says, don't worry about anything. Take it to God in prayer. And as this is done, the unexplainable peace of Christ will manifest itself in our life. And we find this all throughout the scripture. John 14, 27, peace. The, Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And then Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And all of us, you know, as a believer, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, that's the place to start. 
And if you have never made that personal commitment to Jesus Christ and repented of your sin and trusted Christ as your personal Savior, now is a good time to do that and to start. So we can have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God can also give us peace deep down inside. We can be at peace with ourselves. And then the scriptures say, as far as is possible, live at peace with everyone else, everyone around you. So we can be at peace with God, with ourselves, and we can seek to be at peace with those around us. If we spent as much time praying as we do worrying, we would have a lot less to worry about. A couple of months ago, I heard a pastor in his sermon, and he, he said this. He said, get out a pencil and a paper and write at the top of it, my worry list. And then he said, write down everything you're worried about. And he said, after you do that, go up to the top of the paper again and scratch out worry and write prayer in its place so that it says my prayer list. Then he said, pray about those things, take them to God. And I heard that and I go, wow, that is good, godly counsel. Let me ask you this morning, what are you worrying about? God knows what's going on in each of our lives. And God says, here's what you need to do. Now, I want to say that as a pastor and also out as a hospital chaplain, I have been a chaplain in inpatient and outpatient behavioral units. Most people would call it a psychiatric unit. And I have led spiritual development groups in those units, both inpatient and outpatient. And at the end of that group, I would usually say something like, I'm going to be here for a while, and if you want to share your story, I'd love to listen. And I learned a lot from people who, and many of them were born again believers, but they came to a point in their life where life overwhelmed them, and they were admitted into a psychiatric unit. And even as a pastor, I learned that Christians are not immune to bipolar disorders, to depression. We see depression in the scriptures. We, we see, uh, it's mentioned a few times, Elijah on Mount Carmel, he, he was depressed after that great spiritual victory. And so we aren't immune. And as a pastor, I, I would counsel people and say, you know, God knows what's going on in your life. And sometimes there might be a spiritual thing involved, but sometimes it might be more physical. It can be a hormonal imbalance. It can be something going on in your brain that's not right. Go to a good, competent doctor. Get, get looked at, you know, your blood and your hormone level and all of those kinds of things get checked out and see if that's part of what is going on. But I learned a lot from listening, even to born again believers that were struggling with anxiety and worry and fear and depression. Just because you're a Christian, you're not immune. And God knows that. And we need to go to God. And it's okay if we get good competent medical help as well as spiritual help. I want to close this morning by reading the words to one of the great hymns of the faith. What a friend we have in Jesus. Listen to the words to this hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. 
all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. Psalms 55, 22 in the Old Testament says, Cast your burden upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. I had a friend that when I was in elementary school, in his house there was a plaque on the wall, and it said, cast your burden on the Lord and leave it there. And I never forgot that plaque. That's what Psalm 55, 22 says. And at Lakeside Hospital, there's a little board that the staff can write quotes on. And I walked by it one day, and this was what was on that board. If you know how to worry, then you know how to have hope, faith, and God's peace. It's the same thought process with a different focus. What is your mind focused on? Are you focused on God? Are you learning to stand firm in the Lord? Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you gave us a mind that we can think with. You gave us emotions that we can feel. And Lord, sometimes our emotions can be overwhelming, and you know that. But Lord, help us to take it to you in prayer. And help us to thank you as we pray and listen for your answers, for the comfort and peace that your word can give. And Lord, I pray this morning there might be some here who are really struggling with anxiety or worry or fear. Lord, take these truths and help them and minister them to their life. And this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.